Good afternoon to everybody. If you've uh, zoomed in and you're looking to join the Australian Conference on the Circular Economy 2020 uh, and to join the design thinking in manufacturing, you're in the right place. So uh, uh, a very big welcome to you all. My name is Simon Ringer. It's my pleasure to serve as uh, your chair uh, and our host for this one hour session. We will be finishing at four o'clock. And our format today is a panel discussion where we're going to have some terrific panelists uh, speaking to you uh, and giving their thoughts and ideas about design in manufacturing and design thinking uh, and some Q&A and there's an opportunity to ask some questions and we'll be uh, looking at uh, the questions that come through from you uh, in the chat function. Before we dive too far into all of that, let me uh, make an acknowledgement of country uh, and I'm uh, here uh, at the University of Sydney uh, on the uh, traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and uh, I want to pay my respects to the traditional custodianship uh, and the uh, leadership uh, of the uh, Gadigal people, uh, their leadership uh, past, present and emerging. Um, I want to give you all an opportunity to think of uh, your lands, uh, wherever you are, uh, and the traditional custodians of those lands. And I guess as we do that, um, and we think about the idea that we're coming together today uh, on a circular economy conference, I guess when we reflect on uh, Australia's uh, Indigenous peoples um, and, the, and the teachings that they can give us on the circular economy, uh, kind of uh, the mastery, in fact, that they were able to uh, sustain for so many thousands of years. I am in this role today as your chair uh, because I'm a prof in materials engineering here at Sydney Uni and my day job is around uh, research infrastructure planning and, and, and strategy uh, in our core research facilities. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in additive manufacturing. Um, and uh, I'm really uh, excited about the program that the Circular Economy team have pulled together today. So we've got a great panel, which uh, you're about to meet. Um, and what we'll do is give the panel a chance to introduce themselves. Uh, and then we're gonna go around and, and have some opening statements by the panel, uh, some top of mind uh, thoughts on design thinking in manufacturing um, and have then a bit of a conversation, a bit of a QA. and a um, So for folks that would like to uh, pose questions into the chat, please do just uh, type away um, and we'll uh, uh, come to those questions uh, towards the end of the session. Um, and then there's uh, going to be uh, some tours and so on that we'll be uh, announcing the logistics for uh, as well. So that's kind of the, the run format today. Um, it, it's terrific to see the interest in, in, in the program here. I noticed that we've got a mix of folks from industry, from uh, government, uh, at, at different levels of government, uh, and we've got some uh, people from different academic institutions. Um, that's kind of awesome because that's the, the, the crew uh, that are ultimately going to transform manufacturing in Australia. So without further ado, let me uh, go around to uh, our panel uh, and uh, let's meet them. Um, uh, Professor Gwinnell Proust, uh, could I start with you, please? Thanks, Simon. Um, so today I'm here in my capacity uh, as the Deputy Director of the Sydney Manufacturing Hub at the University of Sydney. And as Simon, I'm also a material scientist and uh, looking at different type of material and also um, looking and recycling some of materials. Thank you, Grinnell. And Adam, Adam Amos, Robotic Systems. Hi guys, my name is Adam, Director of Robotic Systems, an engineering consultancy based out of Newcastle, New South Wales. Uh, we create electronic software and hardware to accelerate the journey from idea to commercialized product that our customers own and sell. In the last 12 months, we've had four patents filed by our customers for technology we've developed on their behalf and shipped over $3 million worth of product from our manufacturing facility in Mayfield, Newcastle. So, over to somebody else. Fantastic, Adam. Thank you very much. Uh, Josh Jeffress. 
Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Josh Jeffress, and uh, I work with robotic systems uh, fairly on a daily basis. Um, I run a product design company um, also in Newcastle. So um, I suppose we specialise in, in very similar things, um, taking an idea all the way through. Uh, for our clients, all the way from that initial, you know, spark um, right through to manufacturing and into the marketplace. Um, that sort of involves a wide range of activities from, you know, initial ideation through to prototyping, um, using some of the times additive manufacturing, um, and obviously then through to, to manufacture. And, but it also includes branding and marketing and distribution and all those other aspects of um, the design process. Um, I suppose my my um, also other interest in being part of this session today is um, I did 12 years in, in manufacturing um, as a fitter machinist, and um, we also, you know, manufacturing is integral to our core business at the moment. So, fantastic! Thank you, Josh, uh, and uh, and thank you, uh, Adam, uh, both the founders of of up and coming companies. Josh's company, their design anthology. In case that didn't didn't come across. Michael Sharp. Good on you, Simon. It's great to be here with you all this afternoon. Uh, so I'm the National Director for Industry at the Advanced Manufacturing Growth Centre. And the uh, AMGC is an initiative of the Australian Government to help transform the manufacturing sector. We've got 48,000 manufacturing companies across the nation, and each and every one of them has the ability to uh, advance. And we're seeing that right now because, you know, since the pandemic in the early weeks of March, suddenly the whole world is talking about manufacturing. And so uh, some of the research we've been doing and putting that out uh, to the public has um, been really valuable uh, for these companies to uh, build their resilience over the last you know, eight months now. Um, so our latest report is the 10 ways to succeed in Australian manufacturing. And that's our latest publication, which is available for free for anyone to download on our website. And that's a culmination of the last five years of our research from you know, I guess, Simon, as you know, I've been able to go out to the factory floor and visit our members all across the country. And so to be able to feed that information back and get that in front of government has been really valuable. And so I highly recommend that people have a look at that site. But uh, great to be here today and good to have our members uh, talking with us on this panel this afternoon. Super. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, no, everyone, uh, I'm sure, uh, is uh, aware of the great work at the Advanced Manufacturing Growth Centre and, uh, uh, and the industry team's uh, works there. So look, um, why don't we, uh, Michael, while you have the floor, uh, let uh, you uh, kick us off uh, by teasing out a kind of a, a, a top of mind uh, thing that um, comes to you, comes to your mind when, when, when you think about design thinking in manufacturing. Um, what does that mean for you and what does you think it might mean for uh, Australia? Well, this is where we say that um, there's so much more in manufacturing than just making stuff. Uh, and design plays such an important and key role where you can create even more value uh, in the business uh, and for, you know, for the staff and everyone involved with that business, uh, upskilling and everything that goes with it. So think about 3D printing or additive manufacturing and all of that that goes into uh, prototyping and so much more right now. Uh, the world is changing very fast. Australia's leading companies are getting on board with all of this. And I know you'll hear from our speakers later about the work they're doing. Um, I guess I would refer everyone to the projects that we've been co-funding and just last month at the federal budget we received an additional 30 million dollars for more AMGC projects which we will start uh, early in the new year. Um, but one that comes to mind around uh, the circular economy and design-led thinking is a company called Dresden Vision, a Sydney-based company uh, that uh, is Australia's only manufacturer of prescription eyewear. And this is a company that's uh, started up only a few short years ago and now has stores all across Sydney, uh, in Melbourne, Brisbane, and now also has stores in Canada and New Zealand. So this is a big driver because we know that we need to get more Australian companies looking at the export opportunities. And the way design-led thinking helped Dresden Vision to grow was around looking at the circular economy and using recycled plastics. So they recycle a range of plastics to make high value prescription eyewear that you can go into one of their stores and be fitted up and get your eyes tested and walk out with a pair of prescription glasses. So this is a world's first. It's using a whole range of plastics. And uh, I guess one of the key drivers for us at AMGC is connecting researchers. 
And in Australia, we've got some of the greatest research minds in the whole world, and even right here in Sydney. So the ability to connect our great university minds to industry is a key driver for advanced manufacturing. We know we've got to get more of this collaboration happening. And in Dresden Vision's uh, model, uh, you can see that project on our website and how it's helped that company to grow through collaboration, through real science of looking at the circular economy and how that can impact their manufacturing supply chains, mm. and then helping to grow that startup company to employ high-skilled people here in Australia and develop products that we can export globally. It's an exciting time to be in manufacturing. Thank you very much. That's a very exciting one. Gwenelle, I'm going to jump to you next, but I'm kind of um, just smiling to myself here because I see in the chat, uh, there's somebody uh, in, in the team here that's clearly a fan. Um, and uh, I myself uh, need to get a trip to the uh, optometrist before the uh, end of the year because it's uh, time for some new specs. So uh, I need to give them a look. Um, very good. Gwenelle, uh, what's a, a top of mind thing that, come, uh, that, that you'd like to speak to in relation to design thinking in manufacturing? I think like uh, one thing that uh, come to my mind when we talk about design in manufacturing is thinking about the end life of the product. So uh, everything has a, a, a time uh, on the shelf, whatever you're like, producing, and there's going to be a, a moment where the produce is going to be dis discarded for any type of reason. So what's happening after that? Um, and I think this should be um, included from the starting point. Um, know where um, what you can do next with the material. I think we we have lived a long time in a West um, uh, type of life, and I think it's time that we we revisit the way uh, we produce things. Right, right, um, and uh, uh, and uh, Josh, I was I was going to go to you next, uh, um, uh, but uh, Gwenel. Uh, in 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 thinking about um, the uh, you know the way that we we do things and, and and doing things differently, I got a bit of a hint there from you that you're thinking about the inputs maybe that we're using for the ma the material or the the inputs to the manufacturing um, and and sort of thinking more laterally about uh, those uh, I guess in a circular. Uh, uh, yeah, we, uh, we, we have a project right now uh, with some of my students, my research group, where we're looking at recycling first materials such as uh, wood byproducts or uh, polymers, but we're thinking like how many times can we recycle them? So we are not look, looking only what can we do with those products in a one-time thing, but once, so once we produce something, we are looking at putting this thing in straight again and reproducing something and we are measuring how many times um, by not adding anything else to, um, to the first product can we use uh, and maintain the properties and being able mm. to use it. So I think it's, it's something that, that I have in mind and that we are looking into. Yeah, yeah, very important to understand. Um, yeah, Josh, what's going on in uh, design thinking in manufacturing for you? Simon, that's a good question. Uh, I think design thinking is so broad that it's hard to summarise it sometimes. But I, um, in discussions with Kieran, I, I think, look, design thinking is essentially lateral thinking. That's the way I, I look at it. Um, and from a designer's perspective, you really, from a design and manufacturing perspective, it's really good to consider a broad range of um, aspects of the design before it even goes into manufacture. And, and I've probably, I've written a few down here, but it's probably a, a, a very small snapshot. Mm. But, um, you know, just the basics, you know, how will people use it? Can it be modular so that it can be used um, for multiple applications? So it's got a, it's got more than one purpose. Um, how is it maintained? Look, my background as a fitting machinist, it used to drive me mental when people would put the wearing parts embedded inside of the machine and you'd have to pull the whole machine apart um, to, to maintain it. And essentially what happens in that process is that people get jack of it and they'll discard that machine and they'll buy one that's easier to maintain or, or doesn't need as much maintenance. So those sort of factors um, play a big part in, in not only the design, but also how the product's actually manufactured. I suppose the other thing is, um, how is it actually dismantled at end of life? Um, 
you know, that's that's a pretty big part as well because if you make it expensive to dismantle or you co-mould um, 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 different plastics together, potentially then you make it so that you've actually got a product that can't be recycled um, or is much more difficult to be recycled. So mm. there's, there's lots of aspects to design thinking that can, you know, play a part in manufacturing. But even um, I think there's a real, like talking to manufacturers, there's, there's a real opportunity for manufacturers to actually um, be able to improve the design as well um, because they actually have a lot of expertise, do you know what I mean? And, and bringing that expertise to a product, product designer like us and saying, hey, you've got to like this. What about if we use this process or this material or this um, finish or, or whatever? And that would essentially um, increase the value of the product, um, give it a, a, a better life a cycle, uh, make it easier to recycle. So there's lots of, I mean, look, you can go on for days, but that's a summary, I suppose. No doubt, no doubt. Josh, um, uh, interesting that, um, you know, you've, you've mentioned that you've come into this through uh, your work as a fitter machinist. And so I guess you've seen, um, dare I say it, the good, the bad and the ugly of subtractive manufacturing uh, and also of additive uh, uh, manufacturing um and and that's a very interesting um you know perspective that that you bring yeah, thank you so much mm -hmm. um and so adam uh yeah uh, robotic systems um um what's your take on design thinking in manufacturing so to me design thinking is all about keeping the door open for opportunities options right make creating more options than you're kind of closing you know, closing down so when I'm thinking about what are the ways in which we could keep something in the field for longer, if there's some element of electronics and software as part of that design, it was originally intended to be part of the design thinking, that really keeps the options open in the future to give this thing new life and new relevance as time goes on. As things change in the world, we can change the software without changing the machine to ultimately give it a new purpose in the world. And so, that's where it kind of coming at it from a different angle, I can see there being a big, big opportunity to be able to keep things entirely out of landfill for another decade, particularly in the industry with big, big heavy things because of that ability to add in more smarts as time goes on for the fraction of the cost of the overall machine. Is there a particular example uh, that you're, you're thinking there, Adam? Yeah, definitely. So through, um, so we work with mostly mining and ag companies. We work with a lot of very large existing equipment. And rather than scrapping a piece of equipment that's the size of a dump truck because it's now out of date, uh, we're able to retrofit advanced computer equipment to it to then control it in a new way, effectively keeping you know 50 tonnes of metal out of landfill in, in the real world, delivering value for another 10 years. I see, I see. I guess um, when we think uh, about what you've just been sharing with us uh, and also we, 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 we think about additive uh, manufacturing and, and the uh, opportunities that that is throwing up, we're seeing a lot of people talking about uh, design complexity, uh, design flexibility uh, and also customization. Um, and I wonder if I could uh, offer these as uh, uh, thoughts uh, for uh, anyone to pick up on. Design, um, I guess, complexity because we're able to now uh, examine topologies and, 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 and shapes and structures that uh, are ordinarily difficult, if not impossible, uh, to uh, achieve uh, in subtractive approaches. Um, uh, flexibility because of a, a rapid design uh, uh, cycle uh, and, and, and the speed and I guess time is a is, is, is a key you know parameter in in ultimately a successful business initiative um, and and customization because um, you know we the obvious example I guess around the way that the medical implant business and and, and, a, and a lot of uh, those sorts of businesses are able to uh, no longer are we picking out our hip implant as one in a catalogue, but indeed, you know, increasingly these are going to be customised to uh, individual anatomies. Um, so around uh, opportunities in design complexity and, and design uh, flexibility, 
um, with, especially with the multifunctionality uh, and that customization. Um, how, how does Australia uh, uh, stand in, in, in that space? Um, and and, and are, are we poised to take up the opportunities that uh, uh, we that appear to be there on the face of it? Maybe Michael, I could um, yeah. ask you that one first. Absolutely, Simon. I think it's a very large opportunity for a country like Australia right now. I mean, the technology that we've seen, you know, some people have said we've seen five years worth of innovation over this pandemic. And I think that's pretty right. You know, here I am sitting in my car, um, but what I prefer to call it is the mobile Zoom studio. And so the ability to now talk uh, from the side of the road, anywhere in the country, um, visiting our manufacturing companies all across the country, um, that shows you how much the world's shifted just in a few short months. Um, design plays such an important role and creates value in manufacturing. Uh, if we're talking um, circular economy, this is where we can create these prototypes and try different materials and then be out with the technology we have now like we are here today. I could uh, reach out to Josh and say, hey, Josh, I'm working on this prototype. Um, in real time, I'd like your feedback on the design that I'm working on. Um, I can reach out to Adam at Robotic Systems and ask him questions. And I know that Adam is working with um, other AMGC members uh, long distances away from Newcastle. And so the ability for collaboration now is greater than it's ever been. And if we can create um, new design features and new products that are the world's first, this is how we can build an income for Australia and create those higher skilled and potentially higher paying jobs to really drive the country forward. Um, a great example that I have is another AMGC project that we co-funded with a company in Brisbane called iOrthotics. And iOrthotics have developed world's first technology uh, for the footwear industry. So right now I can use my mobile phone and scan my foot using their app, send it to them from anywhere in the world, and they will use 3D printing technology to build that orthotics, uh, and then they'll send them to me. So it's really changed the way that you'll get fitted for orthotics. Um, there's no wastage material. Instead of having to shave down the foam blocks and make an orthotic that way, they're using 3D printed technology to build those orthotics. And so this is a world's first that AMGC was really proud to uh, co-fund and support that company's growth. And they continue to grow and looking at um, global opportunities. This is where we need to look to because in Australia, we're a small country of 25 million people but we have a global audience of potentially 7 billion customers. So how do we get involved with that? Mm, terrific. Um, and, and Michael, so as my little supplementary in there, um, when, the, when, when you do hear people talking about, you know, advanced manufacturing, this, 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 this revolution, this disruption that, mm. that, that is amongst us, and people will say, ah, you know, these uh, familiar Australian laments um, around the, the tyranny of distance and high cost of labor, those sorts of uh, issues actually uh, really being minimized, if not uh, 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 removed. Um, I noticed you're nodding your head there. Um, uh, uh, it, 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 is, is, is it true? Uh, it, it, it seems that this is an, an opportunity for a, a, a tremendous reset in terms of our, our, our overall uh, capacity and, uh, and, and, and capability, resilience, etc. Would, would you agree? Oh, absolutely. And again, this is where the universities can play a key role. We know that industry must lead this transformation. No one knows your business like yourself. And as I mentioned, we've got 48,000 manufacturing companies across Australia. And so to lead this transformation, the companies must lead that. But they should be looking to partner with our great researchers. And so companies like uh, Design Anthology can now operate globally. You know, it's just, that's the transformation. And so we're building this global village. As Australians, we have this great global brand. No matter where in the world that I travel, people love Australians and they love Australian technology. Think of our great startups from the past like Cochlear and ResMed. They've taken on the world with design-led thinking, making new products that no one had seen before and they're winning. And so we need to create more of these uh, jobs here in Australia. And uh, I have no doubt that uh, with the projects we've already been supporting and there's more to come. Uh, again, this is a very good time for manufacturing. Some people are calling it the great reset. Uh, for me, it was already well underway. The change this year is that suddenly everyone is talking about manufacturing. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And uh, Dane uh, has got some questions in the, in the chat. We'll come to those definitely. Uh, Dane's um, uh, uh, got the 
the question about the elephant in the room around scale. So we'll, we'll, we'll for sure come to that. And folks, um, if you do uh, uh, have any uh, uh, questions uh, for the panelists, uh, please, please put them in there. Some topics that you'd like to uh, have discussed, uh, that would be great. And Gwinnell, I'd like to um, just also throw to you on this uh, uh, business of design complexity, flexibility, customization, uh, because I know uh, one of the things you are interested in is this uh, uh, new place we find ourselves as we produce uh, materials uh, for, for, for manufacturing, where we've got so many decades, uh, even more than decades, I, I suppose, of going to the great trouble of trying to make materials uniform, right? Um, and, and they should be so uniform and, and, and have an integrity uh, about them. So, you know, top left corner, bottom right corner, uh, and everything in between uh, are, are really uniform uh, kind of a, a behavior uh, uh, with known, uh, you know, if, if there was an isotropy, it would all be known and certified and qualified uh, and so on. Uh, and in many of the instances now with additive, whether it be through polymers, ceramics, metals, uh, we're, we're noticing that we need to embrace heterogeneity. Um, so embracing heterogeneity is a, is a tough thing for the engineers because we want to certify things and qualify things and, uh, uh, and, and, and this bit over here can be uh, you know, a lot more uh, brittle uh, than uh, another part over here and, and how, do we, how do we put that into a qualification process and indeed you know, how, do we, how do we design for that. Um, but some thoughts from you? Yeah, so I think yeah, you're right. Before where with the previous um, manufacturing technology uh, we wanted to have homogeneous material, homogeneous components, um, because there was no control of um, where the heterogeneity could come. So we wanted to everything be the same, like that we know what it is. We get the best property everywhere. But uh, with additive manufacturing, we have new opportunity to create what we call functionally graded materials um, or functionally graded structure, depending on which scale you're looking at. And you can, um, if you understand your design and understand, um, for example, where the load bearing capacity should be or which part is going to be uh, subjected to shear force versus some other forces or uh, compressive, you can then really understand uh, where you need to change the structure or the macrostructure of the material to answer the specific, um, specific, um, load bearing capacity at one point. So, and you can do that by saving material. So as you said before, everything was homogeneous. We were aiming to have the max property needed everywhere on the material. So that usually mean wasting material to get there. Now we can, um, we can have, uh, we can design component that are going to be lighter for one thing, because we're going to be able to say, this part is not going to be subjected to anything. So there's no need to have the same amount of material to another section. And by using the additive manufacturing, we have a better control on being able to, um, to manufacture this component, answering to those requirements of where should we have this specific structure or this specific microstructure. So I think this is a new area in terms of manufacturing that additive manufacturing is offering to us to the designer, to the material scientist, to the mechanical engineer, to really, really understand how we can um, improve the design and not waste material at the same time. Mm, thank you, yeah. And of course the structural and the magnetic and electronic properties yes. are similarly, you know, functionally yeah. created. So Adam, your company's name has the word systems uh, in, in the title and so, uh, I, I think, and, and you know, you've 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 introduced uh, robotic systems a bit, and and, and talked about the integration uh, that uh, your your you and the team uh, look to do. Uh, integration and and and, and systems type thinking, um, you know, design is absolutely uh, key to that, right? I mean, the, the uh, your your thinking about design um, of 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 individual components, software systems and the like, but ultimately uh, an integration. And so um, how do you find uh, it is in terms of the, the, the talent pipeline coming into, into uh, design systems design? Um, 
is Australia, how, how would you um, describe uh, the, the kind of the, the Australian scene uh, in terms of systems design? Um, Australian scene, so... From a talent perspective. From, from a talent perspective, yeah, look, there, all the people are out there, right, to do it, but there's a lot of great minds. What I found the biggest challenge to be is getting everybody working towards the same goal because you can have the smartest guys in the room really kind of knowing something about some niche aspect of it, but because they don't understand the wider picture, they actually don't really contribute that much to the overall, the overall um, product. So I would say from a talent pipeline point of view, yeah, look, the, talent, the, the pipeline's huge, right? We're turning out, you know, hundreds of mechatronics engineers a year, hundreds of electrical, hundreds of, hundreds of, or thousands of scientists, thousands of artists, tens of thousands of artists. Um, there's the, the talents there. To me, it's a question of how can we use that time effectively to actually get towards, um, get towards a meaningful goal. So, mm. and really, because if we can't keep that laser focus on solving the right problem at the right time and communicating to your teammates why it's being solved in that way, then really it'll be all for nothing. We'll just end up designing products that um, cost the earth because we've got first world charge rates and are ultimately globally non-competitive. So yeah, and so one's good. This is a good point, Simon. And, and um, you know, Adam's connecting with various uh, AMGC members around the opportunities moving forward. Um, and I mentioned earlier that collaboration is a driver for all this, but the ability to design um, have that design capability is where the real value can be created. And so to share that message, and I see some of the questions coming through, how do we do this? Um, we've just launched this year, the Manufacturing Academy. And so it's a new online portal, which is completely free for anyone in the public to get on board with, log in and learn. And this is manufacturers across Australia that are sharing their experience about how they're transforming their business today to be more advanced. And so we're sharing those case studies, we're sharing those examples of manufacturers that are doing best practice right now. And so mm. for someone to reach out to Design Anthology and have a look at their website, you can see the work that Josh and his team have been doing, um, but they connect with people like Adam at Robotic Systems to put that design-led thinking into action. And so you think about it, um, one of the members might reach out to Adam to design, let's say a new drone as an example. And then, um, the design around that could be, could we use a lighter material to give it more range? What sort of plastics would we need to use? Um, and this is the sort of thing that um, creates value, but to do it, you need that collaborative effort. And so research plays a vital role here. Um, another thing, and I see some of the questions are around scale. I think we have a very broad opportunity in Australia, particularly for the regions. You've got things like uh, local government can play a key role here because they all have the garbage tips, right? So why can't we create the local jobs and the technology at the source of the material? And so then be able to create local jobs in regional Australia using design led thinking from some of our best minds to create a world's first that we can export. Again, this is where we will create value as a nation and we will create those jobs with the new skills to drive us forward for the next generation. That's why I say that it's vitally important that we keep doing these sort of things that we're doing today and sharing our own experience because uh, it was fair to say at the start of the year, most people weren't considering manufacturing. They just saw it as another sector of the economy. What we now say is that manufacturing is a nation's capability. As Australians, what are we capable of producing? What are we capable of making? And how can we earn an income out of that skill? This is what we need to think about. Mm. It, it, very interesting. Josh, uh, uh, can I bring you in there? Uh, uh, with a company uh, named something like Design Anthology. Uh, I, ge I guess, you know, you're thinking a lot about um, connecting uh, talents and, 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 and even organisations together. And I'm kind of curious to uh, hear uh, your comments um, around your view of the talent pipeline. I mean, is this a light touch uh, situation or have we got a, a, a crisis on our hands in terms of the, 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 the design capacity of, um, the talent coming through. What's your take? Oh, look, I, I, I think I look at the end of the day. I totally agree with what Adam said and what Michael said. I think, I think 
what we need to shift in manufacturing is that appreciation for the end customer and what you're actually manufacturing. Because I think at the end of the day, like Adam said, if we're not laser focused, if we lose um, track of what the actual goal is, which is essentially the, the goal of manufacturing is to create products that are actually valued and valuable and will be used more than once, you know, for a long period of time. Um, I, I think it's really important to obviously have that clear vision um, and remain on task. But I think that's where we've, design thinking across the spectrum is really, really important. You know, manufacturers also need to understand why the product's been designed that way. Um, and they also need to understand where it's actually going to, you know, how is that person going to use it? How are they going to unbox it? How are they going to sh ship it to that person? Um, all these factors are, uh, uh, I think really, really important. Excuse me, my robot vacuum cleaner is going in the background. I'm talking about technology. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are, 2020. Automation. Simon, and, a uh, couple, some of the stuff we're working on is around um, our great resources and where we are a resource rich nation. But at the moment, most of those resources are dug out of the ground and then shipped offshore to somewhere else where they create the value. So why can't we create those jobs and that value here in Australia? And a couple of examples around that are uh, lithium mining in Western Australia. And we've just started a project with a company that's building uh, lithium ion batteries here in Australia. So those mining jobs will grow. We will add value to that mined material dug out of the ground here in Australia and then create batteries in Australia that we can sell offshore. This is how we create value from our natural resources. Another one is building a new lightweight alloy. It's 30% lighter than aluminium dug out of the ground in a mine site in Western New South Wales from a product called Scandium, a rare earth material that uh, with this new alloy will not only be 30% lighter, but potentially 30% stronger than aluminium. And so we're working to look at uh, using that new alloy to build such things as bus chassis. And we'll create those jobs here in Australia with a whole new product designed and um, using the resources that we naturally have. But now let's think about circular because we have these waste products that we can tap into. And I talked earlier about regional uh, waste facilities. I really think there's a future there that we need to explore. But again, this export opportunity, because that's where we can create you know, such a global customer base. There's technology being developed for recycling e-waste. Think about mobile phones. I now know that it takes 6,000 mobile telephones to create one ton of e-waste. But if we can use the technology to recycle that electronic waste uh, and make things like 3D filament that we can then use in 3D printing machines. Well, if, if we can uh, get that technology uh, ramped up here in Australia, and if we can create 3D filament materials, we can sell that around the world uh, at a high value. And again, creating that new technology in those uh, jobs right here in country. Mm, mm. Thank you. Hey, so let's um, just jump across to a couple of the questions um, that, have, that have come through and, and uh, we'll pick up firstly uh, on Dane's uh, kind of question around scale. And the question was um, basically just keen to hear views on mass manufacturing and the challenge of design materials and processes in a circular economy uh given employment consumption and capital equipment so i think dane's um kind of um, um signaling that he thinks the uh, uh elephant in the room is the scale and uh how is that compatible with with uh with uh design for mass manufacturing and i i suppose so, it's fair to say that um, many of the examples that we've all been talking about today have probably been um well no i was going to say a little bit more in the um in the uh, uh niche type areas but actually that's probably not true because you know uh footwear and uh, and eyewear is 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 definitely uh, uh mass manufacturing but anybody want to uh, comment on um design for scale yeah, i'm happy to make a comment um i answer this question um fairly often with our customers how do they scale up a product Mm. And how you scale up a manufacturing line when you don't really know how many customers you're actually going to have. And there's a fallacy that I've only recently been educated on that mass manufacturing is the only way to produce stuff. It's not. There are other ways we can 
uh, solve this problem. The, the most common approach is called one piece flow. And it's all centered around this idea of starting manufacture of a single unit and then producing and then shipping a single unit all in one movement. And initially it seems like there's a lot of drawbacks and that it couldn't possibly work, but it does work. And this is where you bring in that local first world high value thinking to start thinking about, okay, well, in the past, we used to, used to only be able to manufacture this in a, at a mass scale and all the problems are associated with that. Massive capital startup, massive venue, you know, venue usage and huge human resource capital behind it. So how can we solve those problems and, and what would be the impacts if we, if we could? And so that is really what I don't think we'll see here in Australia is, is mass manufacturing. What I think we'll see here is really smart manufacturing lines that are able to really elevate above the, the mundane and really start delivering some remarkable and unique manufacturing solutions to, to ultimately deliver that circular economy because the any way you cut it, manufacturing has a huge human component to it. So um, it's it's right at the core of the whole compatibility with the circular economy. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just before I forget, um, I was I was tempted um, when Michael was talking about you know the mining of the the different uh, 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 elements, uh, rare earths and the like, and and those feeding into new materials that we develop. I mean, a bus chassis, if if that was the example, uh, you know, can again be uh, something that's a, a mass manufactured thing, but that manufacturing might not happen onshore always uh, here, but it's the key design. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and the key IP uh, around um, how you do the manufacturing uh, uh, it, it could be Australian. And, and, and so um, it takes us, I guess, from the, from the mining pit to the port, which is, our com which is today's uh, paradigm, to uh, from pit to port, we can move it to pit to part. Uh, and uh, that's something we've been talking about here uh, 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 with uh, with colleagues at the uni. So Chris Rose has got a question for you, Michael, uh, I think, uh, but I'll give you first go at it any, anyway. Mm -hmm. Chris has sort of got a comment here around, you know, uh, if it's circular economy, uh, uh, in, a, in a sense, how big is the circle? Because, uh, uh, you know, uh, circular regional and national companies reducing carbon emissions and, and waste from, from their long supply chains um, uh, so how does, you know, uh, an export opportunity, uh, potentially help us here? Well, I think you touched on one, one example is just then is, you know, we can export the technology. So if I go back to Dresden vision with their glasses, they now have stores in Canada. So, it's, um, design led thinking, uh, from a business here in Australia, uh, that has now exported that design thinking and opening stores in Canada where they manufacture the glasses on demand in the store while you wait. Um, but that technology was invented here in Australia. They own the IP and that company's grown globally. Um, but if it was designing um, and developing a new product out of um, materials that we can use here in Australia, that's the export side is where we see real growth. Uh, again, 7 billion potential customers. Who wouldn't want a piece of that? And so we know that our um, great global companies, you know, they all have to start somewhere, um, but they do take on the world and that's how we create an income for Australia. You know, I say that Australia, we're a superpower. Where else in the world would you want to live? Our superpower is our lifestyle. Um, but to have this lifestyle and maintain it, uh, we need to keep advancing our technologies. Uh, we've relied on being the lucky country for many decades. And uh, I think Adam said it before, uh, we, we can become the smart country. And that's by developing these new technologies. Circular is going to play a key role in that and the material science that comes with it. Um, but we've got great examples uh, at AMGC and companies that we're working with uh, to do that right now. So I've got no doubt of the bright future that's ahead of us. Nice one, Michael. Hey, so Gwenelle, I'm going to bring you into um, this question from uh, Jane Garvin, um, asking about um, uh, what might the university's role be in bringing together, uh, I guess, multi multidisciplinary teams uh, where uh, in design thinking, you know, usually we're, we're looking at options. Her question is that uh, in design thinking, a range of opinions uh, is usually important. How do you draw in multiple disciplines or industry sectors to inform the development of, of the ideas? And at what stage does that happen? 
Okay. Um, so well, I, I'm going to talk on the perspective of the uh, Sydney Manufacturing Hub, which was designed, uh, well, was created with the idea that we're going to get great tool at the university for researcher, first of all. Um, we're, not, we're all going to be enjoying all the new equipment. But the other idea was also to help develop the industry around, around us, like in Sydney first, and then um, we can extend to the uh, more uh, to Australia. But the idea is that all this new equipment or technology that we are discussing um, in additive manufacturing that Simon has mentioned, um, well, they all do, and they still need to be really understood in the point of what can it bring to industry. So um, all the industry not going to have the money to start investing in purchasing equipment that's a million dollar machine. Um, but what they can do is that we have the resources at the university to help them um, get access to this equipment and see what they can do with, the, with them. And we can work with them and other team at the university um, to develop products and to understand how bringing this new technology into the company will help us uh, help them, sorry, create new marketplace for them. So I think the university has a role here in having uh, the equipment and the knowledge as well and resources in terms of, you, know, you talk about time and resources that it's not easy to find. Sorry, that was Charlotte who was mentioning that. Um, that's not easy to find in, in uh, industry environment. At university, we, we have, well, I'm not saying we have that much time, but we have um, the opportunity to try new things. We have students, uh, postdocs, and we are all looking for new challenges and try to answer industry questions. So I think there is a, a good opportunity for industry to collaborate with university in developing those new technology and understand what it can bring in the manufacturing market in Australia. Mm, mm. This it's is a big thing. Of... It's a big thing, Simon, because I say to our members, um, if they're looking to buy a new robot, why would you go out and have to do all that work yourself when the universities have done a lot of that heavy lifting for you? Uh, if you're looking at doing automation, you might be looking at smart sensors. In this context today, we're talking about the circular economy. Uh, reach out to our great researchers. I know that both Josh and Adam uh, partner with the universities and, and it's not just one university. It doesn't have to be just one university. We've got universities all over Australia with great research minds collaborating with industry right across the nation. And this mm -hmm. is where the value can be um, sought because those uh, great minds are working on this technology. And you might be thinking, oh, I think that I could use a 3D printer in uh, this new design that I'm building. Uh, why don't I reach out to the local university and see if I can come and talk to them about doing some prototyping for me. And then as part of that discussion, it might develop that you decide, I need to buy that 3D printer because that design and that brand is what the university has been using for a spe specific reason. So rather than having to shop around and ask the suppliers, you know, the branded names, you know, which one should I use? I often say, go to the universities. They're doing all that hard work for you. Mm. So de-risking uh, ultimately for, 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 for business, um, giving, giving business an opportunity to, uh, to, to de-risk, um, you know, uh, on, that, uh, on that innovation front. Well, of so course, as you, as you know, Simon, the other opportunity then is by getting engaged with the universities you can then become part of larger projects because mm -hmm. I, of, I often find researchers that are looking for industry partners and they reach out to say, can you uh, recommend someone? So I always recommend that our members should engage with their local universities and see if they can be part of a larger project. And this is how they help their own business to grow. Uh, Collaboration is the driver, mate. Absolutely. Look, good, 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 good thoughts there. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, I do agree. Uh, and uh, right across Australia, um, we've got uh, great uh, unis that are, that are doing really well in this field. Uh, and so uh, you can't go wrong there. And funnily enough, just as you were speaking, Sarah, uh, our, uh, one of our co-organisers uh, uh, put a little prompt in about how folks can visit uh, the University of Sydney to look at the Sydney Manufacturing Hub and Gwinnell will talk a bit about that uh, as well because there's loads of dough uh, out there uh, from uh, different uh, levels of government to, 
to forge partnerships between companies and institutions. Look, I want to come to Dominic's question here, policy uh, question. And if it's okay, Josh, I'd like to throw to you because, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, yeah, uh, as founder of a company design anthology, uh, I think that uh, you must have thought a little bit about the, these sorts of questions. His query about the right to repair laws um, and, and sort of, uh, uh, so when, when we do need to repair things, uh, there might be uh, gates uh, as to who uh, can and, and can't uh, do that and enshrining individual agency um, uh, ultimately towards minimizing electronic waste. Um, do you have any thoughts uh, there? Probably not as many as Adam, I would say, on that one. But um, I mean, I, I understand why they do it because it's the intellectual property and you, you, you're keeping other people out of your marketplace. Um, mm. it's, it's a very good, it's a very good um, question, I suppose, because you have to have the balance of, of enabling the business to be profitable, but also enabling people to repair so that those the products can be, um, well, their life cycle can be extended. So I'm going to shoot to Adam on this one. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. So I guess to, to dovetail on what Josh said was, was 100% correct. The right to repair is almost self-defeating due to the complexity of electronic components and the way it's going. You take these phones, right? Remember, you know, 10, 15 years ago, they were enormous. Go open them up, they could be repaired. It was possible to work on them. Now, with the way, that, just taking the mobile phones example, the complexity in them is so wild that you actually can't assemble them by hand. There's nothing you can do without million dollar equipment. And in a lot of cases, it's actually impossible to disassemble the units because of the tightness of integration. And the way, and the reason they've done that is to make them small, to make them light, to make them the best mobile phone in the world, they've given away all those, all those issues. This is a particularly big one for us in the ag industry because farmers have throughout, throughout history, have been the most DIY bunch of people, mainly because of their uh, location. Um, agriculture is a very time sensitive business. Um, even though things seem like they happen slowly, there are moments of extreme activity. And when things get broken, they have to be able to fix them on site. Um, there's court cases running in the US about this at the moment. It will unfortunately end up the same way. There's the technology is getting so advanced that there's not really a way to actually fix it in the field without just doing wholesale component swaps from the same manufacturers. Um, it's, it's, I wish it was something else, um, but the drive towards that next step has come at a bit of a consequence of this. Complexity is high, it's only getting higher. Um, so, so yeah, the, the future's not great for it. <laughs> um, but only thing I could say that will save this is good old competition. So somebody coming to market with a, a solution that does allow it and has that right and has that component right to repair. Um, that's the that's where it will change the game. But until then, yeah, it's, it's probably going to go that way. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now, Aaron uh, has um, uh, a comment, uh, a kind of a, a uh, well, firstly, a comment about um, this, uh, his observations as to uh, how uh, the uh, Australians have been busy with uh, new materials, design and devices, um, but makes the point that uh, he thinks what recent times have shown us is the global network has limitations and constraints and a greater emphasis on local made. And indeed, we have heard a lot about that over the last uh, uh, you know, uh, certainly through 2020. Uh, and um, I guess the question then is the panel also thinking beyond the materials and design components to what capabilities are now needed in the f and, and in the future. I suspect um, this might be um, coming back to the talent side of things, the, the talent pipeline um, and possibly the policy pipeline um, is, is the kind of things that go off in my mind because, um, you know, we've heard everybody uh, on this panel talking about the importance of connections and, and reaching out and, 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 and holding hands through this industry, institutions, universities, uh, 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 startups and government. Um, and, and I guess that um, 
um, I, I would suggest that the way that Australia uh, could 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 kind of botch this up is to is is to not um, uh, thread properly our, our our government policies and resource our government policies uh, tune them to what industry needs uh, and of course um, have the, uh, the the university sector and and, and the publicly funded research agencies uh, all in a kind of a harmony I mean I think um, you know, I, I, I'm going to jump in to say that uh, to Aaron's question, you know, what's so important to all of us uh, that care about manufacturing in, in, in Australia going forward is that we've got a good sync up between what we're doing at, at the different government levels um, and, and, and with, with, with really classy policies that, that, that do a, a great job on the sync up there. Um, I, but, I would add to that, Simon, and just say again that the 10 ways to succeed in Australian manufacturing is a great report. But one, nice. of the key, one of those 10 ways is to engage with universities. And so I mentioned earlier about it being industry-led. Um, business owners need to lead this transformation. You know, we've seen it before because, you know, it's not the first time that we've said that um, new manufacturing techniques will take the jobs. You know, think back to Henry Ford with mass production, the streamlining manufacturing. Uh, everyone said, what about the jobs? And then when I was at school, you know, the, uh, computerization and the internet, um, the teachers at school were saying, you guys will have it so good, you'll probably only work a three-day week. Uh, so you know, the jobs were going to go, but um, we've transformed each and every time. And this Industry 4, this fourth industrial revolution, um, we are transforming. But the universities um, need to be engaged with industry, and in industry needs to come along and get involved with the research projects. And for me, this is where I'm seeing the magic happen, because this is where uh, a business owner can keep up with the latest technology, can be part of projects moving forward and then realize that there's actually a bottom line uh, lift in their business here because they can be part of these new journeys, developing new products and finding new customers. So it's collaboration, it's research, it's advanced manufacturing. Can I just add Simon to that? Is that okay? Um, look, from a design thinking perspective, I think what needs to be spoken about as well from a uh, future, like looking into the future for Australian manufacturers, if we're, if we're talking about Australian manufacturers, is all of their touch points. So like I'm a customer for Australian manufacturers and um, I, I, half the time I can't find people because they don't have a website. Um, so there's number one touch point, can't find them. Number two, can't get in contact with them. There's, there's like into the future, near future, I think that's something that we really should be talking about from a design thinking perspective, because design thinking also incorporates customer service and, and, and how you, you sell your services to people. Do you know what I mean? I think that's a, it's a, it's a big part of it because if you can't find someone, you can't use them. They don't exist. And I think mm -hmm. that's, that's really important. We do have very, we like, we have a very good manufacturing base um, and, and expertise, but I think what we're, we're probably lacking is is showcasing that and i think michael well i don't think i know michael's been working hard on that um but i think that's something that moving forward we we also need to to know um and to improve upon because you can't make it local if you don't know that they actually are local no. great points great points josh no thank you for, for for adding that absolutely key i hope charlotte uh, feels that um we've touched a tiny bit on this her question was around the percentage of manufacturers that are looking for the innovation and design of, of new products and of course um you know the the known uh, issues around uh, resourcing to, to 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 work those into a new business and how we can alleviate the issue and i think that Perhaps um, the takeaway from the panel uh, to that is um, connecting uh, with each other and uh, uh, institutions, by that I mean universities um, and, and, and organisations like the AMGC um, that can help uh, connect us uh, with each other. Now, look, I'm going to throw to Gwinnell for uh, a quick last word on a tour, talking about reaching out and, um, you know, uh, uh, connecting. Um, and Gwinnell, you're running a tour later this week. Yes, so um, the Sydney Manufacturing Hub is uh, hosting a tour for people attending the conference. Um, so it's on Thursday morning. Um, uh, Sarah had put the link for the registration. Um, if you cannot make that date, because I understand some people might have other commitment, please reach out to the Sydney Manufacturing Hub on our website 
and we'll be delighted to give you a tour another time that is more convenient. So um, if you are available on Thursday morning, please join us, uh, register. There is a one, two, or at least there might be a second one if we have um, more interest to maintain the number of people inside the lab at the moment. Um, but uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us to, uh, to come if you are not in Sydney right now and you want to visit at another point. And Simon, can Fantastic. I just say uh, congratulations to you and your team there because you know the social media engagement too. For everyone out there, have a look at the Twitter feed coming through from the Sydney Manufacturing Hub and LinkedIn you know, work coming through from Simon and, and others there at Sydney University. This is a key way we can get those messages out of uh, world first technology. So congratulations. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, look, uh, I think we've reached the hour. So uh, a big thank you to you, Michael. Gwinnell, fantastic. Thank you. Adam, good luck. Robotic Systems uh, and Design Anthology founder, Josh Jeffress. Thank you to you. Thank you to all of the folks that uh, 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 stuck with us through the hour. A really nice discussion. Thank you for the questions. And thank you to all of the organisers for the Australian Conference on the Circular Economy 2020. This session is now closed. Thank you.